Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is, uh, as with many people, this is the first time I've been to a 3D <laughs> conference. It's quite a long time. Um, I am here to talk about um, internal tech conferences um, and what they can do to help learning in a, in a collective way across your department. Um, and there's going to be four aspects to what I'm going to cover here. I'm going to talk about what, um, why you should run one, what makes a great one, some things to avoid, some pitfalls, and um, also some observations that we've made over the last couple of years about the differences between online and offline events. So a bit about me, um, very briefly, I work for the Financial Times where we've run several of these internal tech conferences over the past um, six or seven years. Um, and after that, I, uh, Matthew and I co-wrote this book. And so a lot of what this talk is about is derived from that. So um, more in that it's available in the auction. So go and bid and give some money to Ukraine. Um, so first off, what is an internal tech conference? Well, essentially, it's, it's, it's what you might imagine. It's bringing everybody together. Um, it's by the people, for the people. It's something that's uh, designed by the employees in your department to give them an opportunity to share knowledge, experience, ask challenging questions of the department and to, to get conversations going that in terms of try, try to kind of uh, grow and, and learn together as a, as a department. So why would you run one? Um, it might be to connect people. So connection has always been important. If I always felt it was useful to bring people together to build connections, but obviously in the last couple of years, that's become even more important. Um, we have companies who, whose meeting locations are simply time zones because it's irrelevant where people are. So we can't rely on those water cooler moments. A few people have talked about that. It's, a, it's clearly a very present theme. So we need to create um, these situations to bring people together where it takes a bit more effort than it might have done before. So it's even more important. And also, we need time to reflect and share. So our teams are, are you know, they're, they're working on their own thing. We can't expect everyone to come a lot to um, move at the same pace with everything that they're learning. Teams need to be able to innovate if they're going to progress. But in order for those that knowledge don't not get stuck in silos, it's, it's really valuable to, to come together and share things together. And you could see it as a bit of a, a whole company-wide, department-wide retro. It might be about accelerating learning. Um, Gabrielle put this really well yesterday morning, really articulate about the speed of change. You know, so, so, so our products now are, you know, there's a lot of network effect in our products. The more people use them, that's how the value increases. So we have to keep innovating. We have to keep building quite quickly. Um, other changes around us, whether it's climate, geopolitical change, these are things that are moving rapidly. They're changing the markets and companies need to be able to react quickly either with new technology or adapting technology and processes. We have to be able to move quickly. So however we can get our teams to learn together and share knowledge so that everyone can move forward at pace so that we can keep improving and, and, and improve our ability to adapt um, and to situations swiftly is really valuable. It might be because you want to enable some standardization in your department. Maybe you want to see people um, adopting common practices and tools so that you don't, don't end up with potentially silos all reinventing things and, and not coming together and sharing. Seeing the variety of problems and solutions that teams are, are doing. So we're, we're doing amazing things. We're doing really difficult things sharing those things, sharing how we've solved things so that different teams can, can adopt the things, the, the good practices that others have done, means that you can see some um, consistency emerge with a kind of a, a voluntary standardization rather than imposing something that potentially slows teams down. So if we know why we should do one, then um, how do we do a good one? So while every internal tech conference is different, and it should be, there's some things that you just need to get right if you want to have a really lasting impact with it. So we're talking about a big event here, but you, you don't want people to walk away and forget about it. So if you want to make an impact, some key things to get right. So first up, planning. Um, it's going to take a long time, as those who've organised this event <laughs> will attest. Um, it doesn't always take two years but it, it, <laughs> due to current events, but um, you do need a long time. Don't expect to be able to plan this in, in a couple of weeks. 
Um, you need to think ahead about those risks. What could go wrong? What if all your out of practice speakers forget to bring their clickers? How are you going to cater for that? Um, and it's going to cost some money. It doesn't come for free. Get a clear idea of what money you need for this event to go smoothly and be ready to, to plan that and spend it wisely. Another thing that's really key um, for an, a good event is that it's well promoted. So you're going to need to persuade speakers to speak. Um, it's an internal conference. You are going to have people who are really smart, have got lots of ideas and knowledge, but they're not naturally going to necessarily put their hand up and go, me. So you need to be able to persuade them. You're going to need to be able to um, entice people to come and attend, potentially take their time out. So it's really good if your organizing team encourages people who are, includes people who are really influential and energetic and persuade people to come along. And it sounds obvious, but a really successful event is one that runs smoothly. So practice it, rehearse the flow. What are the transitions like between the sessions? Are you gonna have music? How is that gonna flow? What is the sequence of events? And make sure you've rehearsed it well. And one consistent theme that comes out from all of our case studies that we've done is the need to mentor speakers. So again, for external events, you know, we could all do with a bit of help, we can all do better, but for internal events, you need to actively mentor them. These are a lot of them would be first time speakers, maybe shy, you know, t taking time to make sure that they have a positive experience is absolutely key. And then finally, a successful event is one that is well reported. So we're gonna talk about the goals of certain events um, in a moment, but know what they are and then celebrate them afterwards. So make lots of noise, make sure people don't walk away at the end of the day and forget all about it. So promote the learnings, promote what's happened and, and, and celebrate it and, 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 and let people remember it for time to come. So in order to achieve those things, how do you do those things well? So there's some key success factors which are related, which are just those previous points in a bit more detail. The first one is know why you're doing it. So there, there could be many reasons for running one of these and you're not just running it for the sake of it because someone said it's a good idea. What is it you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to promote learning? Are you trying to um, bring in some industry expertise that people have gained outside? Are you trying to encourage um, a, a kind of learning across teams on how you might solve common problems or new, new ideas or technologies? If it's all about learning, then you might favour an event which is about long talks and workshops and panel discussions where you can really get into a topic in depth. The first one at Financial Times was exactly that. So it was triggered by a handful of people who would go to conferences and they were the usual suspects and they would go to conferences regularly and after a while they were saying, they're just validating things that we already know, but that was those as people as individuals. So we had lots of knowledge around the department, but it wasn't being shared. So the point of this was to enable sharing of knowledge and that was the driver for that one. So it was quite information heavy, it was long talks, with, um, sharing expertise and panel discussions that were kicked off by short talks by an expert on that topic. Are you trying to invite some democracy? trying to open the floor and get some conversations going, maybe about some, some challenging topics, inviting people to challenge the status quo on how the department or the team could be run differently. If you wanted to get some conversations flowing, then you might instead favor panel discussions, open spaces, um, and perhaps um, some, some workshops where people, again, um, really start to debate these things. So that first FT event, it wasn't just about a lack of knowledge at that point. It was quite a few years ago and that happily now. We all, it was also opinions that weren't being shared. So there were conversations that were due and they just needed to be surfaced. So we had our panel discussions there were really quite powerful. We had the CTO on the same panel as a number of other people and people were invited to throw any questions up there. And it, it really started some conversations to flow. And the second year, the questions of the panel moved away from technology choices and became about the departmental structure, about diversity and inclusion, about, you know, about things which were about the nature of the workplace we want to be. And it was really powerful for making everyone accountable, actually, for creating the workplace that you want to be in. So as a cultural shift, that was really effective. Is it about building connections? Is it about taking time out from the day to day, enabling people to to geek out with their colleagues on something that's different than what they normally do? Is it about trying to build some social capital between people who don't normally work together so that when difficult times arise, 
they're a bit more equipped to be able to deal with them. In that scenario, you might favour, again, open spaces, workshops, masterclasses, games, lightning talks, things that are a more, more a sli slightly lighter, perhaps. Um, 2020's conference for FT was a one year into the pandemic. So it was very much about building connection. It became, it was even more critical that year um, and that people would have been, you know, divided, uh, isolated, lonely. So that was all about open spaces and games. And we had some masterclasses where people were teaching things. And, and, and so it's a very different feel. Or it might be to celebrate success. So have you got some awesomeness that you want to surface and celebrate? Do you want to get excited? Do you want to show off to the rest of the department, to the company? Um, have you got some unsung heroes that don't get mentioned in your product releases that you want to be able to give an opportunity? In that sort of scenario, lightning talks can be useful for those people who aren't practiced and who don't get much limelight. They're less intimidating and a nice opportunity to, to give them a, a moment. Um, but also there you might be, it might be about demos, it might be about training taster sessions, maybe you want to teach your CEO to code. Um, so the, the lightning talks and so on is how we've achieved those things. And then recently we've been doing a, a delivery conference, which is slightly different. It's delivery managers running something, it's by delivery, but for the rest of the organisation. So there's lots more to doing delivery than, than, than tracking the work through the board. And it was an opportunity to share some of the skills, techniques, that are the broad range of skills that are in this discipline to the rest of the company. It had a really wide audience, lots of interest. So again, a, a, di a different goal. And the point is, whatever your goal is, it might be one of those things, it might be several, it might be none. Knowing what it is before you start will enable you to shape and design your conference to achieve that outcome, because it'll be different every time. So be clear on what that is before you start. Second thing, plenty of planning. So I mentioned planning. I mentioned it takes time. I would say to do an internal tech conference that's in person, you probably need six months. There's quite a lot to do. Um, for an, a remote one, there are less things to organise, but the thing that doesn't shrink is the time it takes to find your speakers, assemble a schedule and give them lots of time to prepare their talk. Again, remembering they've got a day job and they're not practised. So you can't do it too quickly. Um, money, you need to think about what are those things you need to spend cash on. If it's a physical event, you've got your venue, which actually choosing your venue early often dictates your time scale as well. So when I said it takes time, um, you need to think about travel, possibly for remote team members, um, swag, <laughs> food, um, audiovisual, are there things you need to pay for and all of those things. Um, if you're doing a remote event, some of those things you don't need to pay for, you don't need to lay on a big spread for a remote event. But what a lot of people are finding is that um, still sending some edible treats to people who are taking part can make it feel like a special experience and they're part of something. Um, that can be fiddly, trying to send things to lots of different addresses. And there are companies that can help you. Um, and I just wanted to call out one company who I think are amazing, if you haven't heard them. They're called Hug. They not only have a lovely name and they not only do really, really lovely treats and take the, tr the pain out of it for you, but they also just have an amazing company ethos and they've always got something else they're doing on the side to help society, which at the moment is a free platform to enable welfare vouchers to reach people who need them and so on, things like that. So um, use them if you're going to do something like that. You need to think about your venue. I mentioned finding it early. If you're doing a physical event, think about do you want on-site or off-site? How imaginative or expensive do you want to get? Do you want to do a big room or do you want to have several small rooms? Those things will determine the structure that you can have to your event. For your, on, off, for your online event, when it comes to venue, you're thinking about the, city, the circumstances of the speaker. Are they somewhere quiet? Are they comfortable? Do they have a good mic? Do they have good lighting? Do you want to send them any of those things to help them be more present and, 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 and do well in that setting? Um, and then assembling the schedule, I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment, but again, I said it, it, it takes time to, to get this right. Catering, do food, do nice food, that time where people are mingling and eating in the breaks. When it comes to your internal event, that is actually the most important part of the day. That's when people are building those connections, so make sure it's a really positive experience that they kind of relax into and don't spend grumbling about pizza. Although I've recently discovered people do actually still like really like pizza. <laughs> 
Um, and because there's so much to do, this is really important. Make sure you've got the right organizing team who are putting it together because it's, it's, it takes a lot to do. They've got to be people who really uh, genuinely want to make a difference to the department because they will throw themselves into it and they will want to make this a success. Um, so have, a, have, have an enthusiastic team who are ready to champion, who are ready to go out doing that influencing and persuading and, um, and potentially defending whatever structure comes out. If it doesn't fit the management agenda, never mind, it's what people want. So you need to have the right team there. It might be people who are itching for some change and want to trigger some stuff. The other thing about the team is um, you want to have a diverse audience come to your event and feel included. Therefore, you want um, all of the, you want uh, your speaker panel to represent your entire department so that they feel included. The best way to make all of that happen is to have a really diverse organizing team who are thinking about and considering all of your employees and their different needs. So consider that in the makeup of your organizing team as well. So the well-structured schedule um, I, hats off to the, the team for, for this event. They've done an, an astounding job here managing the energy. We've learned some things about managing the energy in the day. A bit earlier in the day, people have got a longer attention span and they're more likely to sit and listen to a talk, so thank you. After lunch, people are digesting their food. You'll want some interaction. <laughs> this is what happens after, you know, people are more, a bit more, um, yeah, a little lower in energy. And then towards the end of the day, you need something energizing again to lift things up and get people ready for a really good social event at the end of the day. Um, Drunk Agile was a, a really good example. And then throughout the day, lots of breaks so that people can feel refreshed. So managing that energy is really key so that people don't come away drained. Varying your mix of content and formats. Um, this doesn't just kind of uh, shift things about for energy levels. It just generally makes it more interesting. Some people like a good talk and they could spend all day listening to good talks. Other people like debates. Other people like, like people like to experience different formats. So if you want your entire department or as many of them as possible to get something out of the day, then vary the format. And also vary the content because it's tempting to think that for an engineering department, mostly what they want is stuff that's technical, but they're interested in the same stuff that everyone here is interested in too. They're also interested in culture and in people and about how we work. So vary the topics um, to keep it interesting as well. I mentioned this um, already, but represent the, uh, representing those diverse voices so that everyone feels included. So you're thinking demographics around you know, age, gender, race, but also think about seniority and role and the team that people are in. Think about some of those quieter voices and how you surface those. So you'll have really enthusiastic people who stick their hand up quickly and go, oh, yes, I'll talk, me, me, me. Encourage those and, and get excited and include them, but don't let them hog the show. So. Um, at FT, we've managed to achieve this sort of representation, but we've, we're pleased that we've managed to do it without um, having to say no to anybody to make room for someone else. So sometimes we've just asked someone to give a slightly shorter talk so that we can fit another one in or maybe ask two people to talk. So it's just a matter of being creative um, without having to be exclusive. And they're really important are well-supported speakers because if your speakers don't have a positive experience, they won't volunteer next time. And without well-supported and, and uh, comfortable speakers, you don't have a good event. So attracting them to begin with, think about what people might get out of it. Everyone will have their own motivation. It might be um, development, personal development skills and experience. It might be getting some recognition. It might be there's a subject that they're really interested in and they're just looking for an excuse to really delve into in order to learn more about it so that they can speak authoritatively about it. Um, and then also the other reason to um, have a mixed variety of formats is that actually for your speakers, some will like to give a talk. Others might like to host a panel where it's not all about them and there's some safety in numbers. So that's another reason to, um, to, to, to vary the formats that you've got. And before the event, in terms of supporting them, um, be ready to spend some one-to-one -one time mentoring them, help them um, uh, construct their story, design their talk, target it to their audience, create compelling slides, uh, and also their speaking techniques. So remembering to breathe and, and move around, which I haven't done much of because I'm not used to it anymore. <laughs> engaging with the room um, and, and things like that. Um, 
and the, the differences between online and offline events, the, 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 um, the, the skills needed and the things they need to practice are different. So right now I'm missing the script that I used to read off last year, whereas last year I missed seeing a human audience um, and it's really difficult to just speak to a screen. So they're different skills, different things you need to practice. So help them with that. And during the event itself, have some check in on them early in the day, make sure they're present, they're all right, they're not too anxious, have someone ready to encourage them up onto the stage and give them a congratulations when they come back down, have the MC really warm up the room because they're nervous and they want to go on feeling good and make more of them than you maybe would in, in, in other scenarios because, again, they're, they're possibly a bit more nervous than, than some of us pretend we are. <laughs> and then after the event, follow up with them, make sure that they had a positive experience. You know, what did they learn? What did they enjoy? Did they feel supported? Um, and if there are any feedback that they've got for you in terms of the support that they got for during the event, because if they come away feeling positive, as I said, they'll, they'll come back next year and that's what we want. So some pitfalls to avoid. Um, don't forget why you're running it. <laughs> the by the people for the people bit is really important. Um, if you want your organising team to be motivated in organising a really good event, then give them the autonomy to design one that suits the needs of the department and not what the management say they want to get out of it. So um, let them uh, design it. Don't you leave your speaker selection too late for all the reasons I've talked about. It takes time and they need time to get ready. Don't forget to practice the tech. Does everything, people come with the wrong adapters, etc. And at home, do people have the right cameras? All that stuff, make sure you've practiced it. And at the end, uh, the follow-up is really key for your lasting impact. You are doing this for a reason. So what is that reason? You ideally, you, you want some ripple effects to happen after this. So if during those open spaces or panel discussions, you're hearing ideas or actions that people are suggesting might happen, capture those, <laughs> follow up on them, um, and nudge those things along, because that's where the good stuff really comes, is the stuff that happens afterwards. So catch it and nudge it and be ready to encourage it. Um, and also just celebrating it, telling people what a great event it was. Um, all of that helps you to make a good business case to run another one the following year, um, and it helps people remember it and so on. So that's really, really key. So a couple of things that we've learned, the difference between in-person and um, online. Um, we've got new words in our dictionary. Um, this has been talked about by other people. And online, a whole day on calls is exhausting. So you need to find different ways of doing it. So do you maybe do shorter half-day events more often, maybe three or six months? Or do you do what, um, what a brilliant company did where they've taken their one-day event and split it across the whole week, two hours every day? I'm going to talk about that in a moment. It was excellent. Other things that are different. Strangely, it's, it's sort of less formal um, online. Um, the speaker isn't on a stage, literally above everybody else. You're all on a screen. You're all kind of equal. Um, everyone has access, lot, often, not, not always, but for an internal one, but everyone has access to the chat. It's, people are much more informal in that, and it's really nice that that, that, is, that is more informal. It's more inclusive. It means you need some good live moderation because your speaker won't be able to follow, follow the whole chat as well as giving their talk and be able to catch and respond to questions. So you're going to need to manage that a bit. It comes with advantages, though, and these are things that we should remember. Um, one huge thing is live captioning. Massively easy if you're doing it online. It's, you can just do it. And actually, if you're doing it in, in person, then if you're recording it, then you can also apply that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's been a really big thing. It's, you know, whether it's um, people who are, you know, who are hearing impaired or actually maybe some, maybe other people who have a preference for reading rather than listening, maybe the strong accents. There's a number of reasons why um, that's really useful and it, become, it became really easy. Um, that bit about live moderation. Um, you can avoid that bit where the microphone goes around the room and someone says, oh, this is more of a comment than a question, but it's, you can, you can prioritise the questions as they come through through the tool and make sure they're actually relevant to the people who are going to be in the room. So that's really helpful. Um, I'm moving on quickly because I wanted to mention this company, the one that uh, moved to a one-day event. Um, and I'm talking about Redgate Software. Some people might be familiar with them. They run a, a brilliant tech conference every year called Level Up. Um, really good and gets a lot of celebration, but obviously um, they couldn't 
during the pandemic. And so they took the decision to take this full day event and split it two hours um, every day for a week. And um, it was hugely successful. Um, these, are, these, these, these are the key learnings lifted directly from their blog. Um, largely speaking, they found that they could deliver an even more inclusive event um, that was more sustainable in terms of how people absorbed it. And so at FT, we copied them <laughs> for an event that we did last year, and we did this, and it, it's, it's absolutely true. And people were fully engaged and present for each session because they'd had time to digest and process the previous one, and they were fully refreshed, and um, people experienced each session in, in, a, um, in its own, in a, in a way that they haven't in other, in other events. So it's really powerful. So just to wrap up, there are three things I um, would, would kind of just reinforce you to take away from this. The first is mentor your speakers, mentor your speakers, mentor your speakers. It's really important for internal speakers to encourage them, to help them, give them all the support you can. We've got a Speakers Guild, FT, people who have volunteered and are more than happy to advise. It's a really good idea. Practice, 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 the, t the, 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 uh, the movement between things, all the tech, everything and follow up afterwards to reinforce that message. And a special one for today, the fourth thing is bid in the auction because the book has got loads of checklists and guidelines and things just to make it really easy. Um, and you can get it for, you can help you know, some, some people out if you, if you bid out there. So basically try it, experiment with it. I'm really keen to hear how they go. So anyone who has run them or anyone who does do them, I, I, I really like to collect stories <laughs> and good ideas that we can nick and that we can promote. I quite like tweeting about different things. So if you've done something really good, tell me. I'd love to hear about it. Um, and finally, just a hat tip for <laughs> the NIGEL London. It's, it's been a great event. So most of the things I've mentioned on here have been done really well here. So um, there are differences between internal and external. Many more things that have to be thought about than I've covered here but um, an excellent event and I've loved it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Have we got time for any questions? Yeah, we've got four minutes. Oh, wow, there we go. I, I, I hope I wasn't illegible. I was speaking quite quickly. There was a highest hand. Thank you. <laughs> so um, it sounds like insight, meaning like, you know, in a company, it sounds so easy. And there is really a need for that. So I really want to do it with my client as well. But I come to that point that either online, you have the problems like using the same tools because you have all the external partners and they are not allowed to use this one or that one or that one. Or the company itself is not allowed to use good tools. And then uh, if it's on site, it's as well like, you know, who is able to come because the external partners can only um, have their, um, uh, get the money only for, for a specific uh, work. Mm -hmm. So um, then it should not look like they are internal ones. So compliance issues come in. And all those questions are really problems um, preventing bringing the right people together mm -hmm. in that place and going for invention, right? Uh, something like this or connection or whatever it is about. Um, so we have, do you have any ideas to that? I think it just depends on, on, on what the primary goal is. Um, so we've, when we've, we've had events where we've brought um, uh, partners in, they've self-funded to a certain extent because actually they want to do business with us, with us and it's in their interest to have a really good relationship with us as well. So in terms of the, the, the time that they spent at our event, I don't think we've necessarily paid them for that time because they see it as in their investment in building a relationship with us. Um, other times we, we actually consciously haven't brought them because if we're wanting to surface discussions which might be about, you know, if we, if we shift to this way of working, what does that mean for that discipline? <laughs> if we, you know, in really kind of contentious topics, if we want to have a really safe space, we need to keep it really in, in, internal. So it, it's different from year to year in terms of what our goal is. If, if partners being there and them bringing their knowledge and, and that relationship is important, I would be working with them to, to look at, you know, how can they contribute towards funding that um, and the platforms and technology I think you know I would always kind of go with whatever the host company is using and, and trying to make it as, as as easy as possible for them to use it but th this is what we're using and, and do some practice runs with them and do they need accounts set up you know how do you make it as easy as possible for them to be able to use it for that limited time I don't know if that helps but that's how we've kind of approached it it doesn't remove the barriers it might just yeah. help a bit uh, I've got a question 
have you seen an increase in the number of your colleagues from FT speaking at external conferences after their experience of speaking at internal conferences? Yes, yes, hugely. It's a really safe practice space, especially lightning talks the first time round, and then they do a longer one, and then, you know, um, they, they're, they're all set to do it externally. Yes, much so. And so it's, it's often, that's one of the benefits that people can get out of it. And when you're trying to coax people to talk, it's, you know, if you want to go outside, try it here first and learn, because we're a safe space. Yes. In terms of setting an agenda or deciding your purpose, would you crowdsource that from within the company or do you decide on that yourself based on conversations you've heard? How do you go about deciding that? Um, so we've typically, it's a different, people do it differently. So um, some companies just do a completely open call for papers. Anyone can submit anything. Um, and then other companies um, decide that there may be some themes that they're aware of that given because they're in, in, in touch with conversations that are happening on the ground and changes that are trying to shift maybe we'll have a, a theme which is this and a theme with that and ask people to submit talks based on those themes with an other bracket because there's some really good it's, it's important to have another you know so that people can submit anything and surprise you with something really cool that you just didn't even think of and that can sh change the agenda but keeping it as open as possible um, with some nudges if you want, but if, if you constrain it too much, then uh, you put people off. <laughs> um, we're out of time, Victoria, okay. but thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.